everybody. Welcome to MBS AE Row uh, Career Focus Friday. Um, my name is Christine Johnson, and I'm here today with Thomas Dean. Uh, he is a rigging gaffer um, in the film industry here in Atlanta, um, and he has worked on such films as probably ones you might know, Black Panther, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, um, Doctor Sleep, uh, Coming to America 2, and he's worked on three seasons of Homeland, Dawson's Creek, I could go on and on. He has a 30-year career in the film industry, and he's agreed to talk to us today. So let's welcome Tom Dean. Welcome, Tom. Hi. Good to Hi. be here. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the business? Um, I started... Uh, getting interested in the film business in eighth grade they had a, a program in my junior high school and um, they took us out of social studies class uh, kodak provided film had little eight millimeter cameras um, so i got interested in it back then i worked at a little production company in my hometown when i was in high school uh, went to college at uh, the university of memphis which was called memphis state at that point um, worked in the film production department there for a while and then uh, got out into the professional side of the business and um, worked as a cameraman for a little while as a electrician doing lighting working on set and uh, most recently now here in atlanta i've been um, on the rigging side of it which is uh basically the, the prep crew and the strike crew for the lighting department. Okay, can you explain to um, people that are, are watching what exactly is a rigging gaffer? Uh, the rigging gaffer, um, in, on, a, on a film production or a television show, you have the um, cinematographer who is the head of the camera department, and then you have the gaffer and the key grip that work on set for the cinematographer helping him light and do camera positions and stuff like that and then you have a rigging key grip and a rigging gaffer that help the lighting and grip department prepare for the production to actually be there filming so we do the prep work um, on locations we lay in cable and power and get lifts um, like lighting platforms and that kind of thing ready on stages we put in all the dimmer system infrastructure the data that controls all of the led computerized lighting that we use nowadays so it's it's really um and then we go in after the production company has been there and take it all back down break it down, return it to the rental house if it's just rented for that one set or that one location. So we, um, we do the work that takes a longer period of time for the shooting crews so that they're not having to put in all the infrastructure when they get there. They can light the talent in the scene. We kind of get the scene ready as far as power and all of the prep work okay so could you tell us like some of the I, I mentioned some of the shows you worked on i know that you've worked in tv and you've worked in film as well um what is the difference between the two or is there a difference between the two um on episodic tv you will revisit locations a lot um like on homeland we had recurring locations that we would go back to uh, for day work or night work or any combination thereof. And then you would have locations that would be new. Um, they might appear in one episode. So you have uh, a scout that happens and you'll go to all of those locations on the television show for each episode and talk about what's going to happen. Um, but in TV, you have locations that will recur. Like on Homeland, we would go back to Brody's house repeatedly as an exterior location. And then the interior of that was on the soundstage. The CIA exterior was a big corporate building and then the interiors were on a soundstage. 
So you go back and you leave things rigged for a longer period of time. On a feature film, um, you will go through and scout as many locations as they know of at the start of the movie, depending on how big the movie is um, and scheduling changes. You might not be able to scout all of them or you might have to go back and just look at a certain location that changed or something like that. But you don't wind up on a feature film. Usually they will try to get the location ready, shoot everything they need at that location, and then finish it up on a feature film where you might, over the course of six months, go back to a location repeatedly on a television show. But the scope of the work is very similar as far as what we do rigging wise. Can you, can you explain, I know that it's very rudimentary, but can you explain like what exactly do you do on a scout? Like as a rigging gaffer, what would you do on a scout? Uh, well, generally we will all have a copy of at least a preliminary script. So you read through that and then uh, you have the director, assistant directors, um, everybody goes to all the different locations and the AD department will tell you, these are the scenes that are taking place and this is what we wanna shoot here. And then the director will kind of give you what his vision is as far as what he wants to see at that specific location. And then you kind of break off into little groups and the art department will talk about what they need to do. Like, do we need to repaint this interior of a room and we need to get rid of this furniture and we need this kind of stuff. We'll talk about lighting wise and grip wise. Okay, we need a camera crane here and we need, you can hide the generator over in that direction and we want to bring lights in through these big windows over here. It's a daylight scene. We want to make it real shafty light coming through the windows. And so you, you talk about each individual location and the scenes and what you need for that and compile lists of equipment that you need. Um, to get what the cinematographer wants to do for the final scene, what he wants it to look like. You get all the nuts and bolts of what you need to make that happen. Okay. So you can't be afraid of heights doing what you do, huh? <laughs> no, no. We, um, we use um, man lifts a lot in, the, in our work um, uh, to put, lights up in the air. Um, it is something that you definitely need to be comfortable working on elevated platforms. Safety is always important, obviously, and um, we always require safety harnesses and procedures be followed as far as securing stuff so that everyone's safe. Okay, and I just, how do you get power in places that have no electricity? Uh, we will bring in a generator uh, out on location and we have to figure out which way that the camera is going to be seeing and which way is we call it safe. Um, so you always try to put the generator obviously so that it's not on camera and far enough away from set that your friends in the sound department aren't going to be complaining that they're hearing the generator running. Um, sometimes, depending on the, the scope of the scene and how big it is and how much you need to light up, we might have two or three generators out on a specific location. So we bring our own power in. A lot of the lighting that we use uses a lot of electricity, so we can't go into a house and use a lot of the lights that we use, especially for like big night exterior work you couldn't use the power that's available at a house to power all of, all of the equipment right. necessary. Right, so I know this is probably a question everybody's dying to ask and wants to know, but um, you've worked on a lot, you worked on quite a few Marvel movies and um, Black Panther being one of them, and that was a groundbreaking movie, which must have been very exciting to work on. Um, and I know that uh, Marvel has a lot of NDAs in place and everything. Can you compare like what it's like to work on a Marvel movie to what it's like to work on say like mile 22 that you did? Um, in, in the rigging department and every, 
every movie is different um, and every movie is similar in some ways. Um, when you get onto the bigger Marvel movies and the big blockbuster action, the work just multiplies. So you have more people in management managing a larger number of people that are actually completing the work. Um, where on a smaller, lower budget movie or a television show, you might have four or six people that are on the rigging crew on a larger scope movie. You might have 20 or 30 people on the rigging crew that are broken up into smaller crews of six or eight people that are completing different tasks all at the same time. So it, um, it's the same work. It just becomes a lot more management and completing a lot bigger amounts of work all at the same time simultaneously. You may have a rigging crew working on three different stages at once on a Marvel movie where you may only have one stage with three sets on it on a smaller budget movie. So it's, uh, it's similar. It just, uh, it depends on the scope of the work that you're trying to complete and the amount of time that you have to do it. Okay, just out of curiosity, I know this is just kind of a random question, but when you were working on Black Panther, did you think it was going to be as groundbreaking and as, um, what is the word I'm looking for, as like impactful as it was when you were working on it? Did you have that feeling or was it just like, you know, hey, this is a really cool movie, we're working on it? Uh, I I didn't have any idea that it would be um, as impactful as it wound up being socially. Um, it was it was fun to work on. We did a lot of really neat things and big sets, and it was a, a fun movie to work on. Um, I was I was actually a foreman on that, um, so I was working for the rigging gaffer, running three or four crews underneath me at one of we had two different stages or two different stage facilities with numerous sets on each one and a lot of location work. So there were three foremen, there was a rigging gaffer, three foremen, and then several crews that would complete the work. So it was a pretty large scope project. We got to do a lot of really neat things. Um, and I knew it was gonna be a, a good movie when we were making it. I didn't have any idea it would have the social impact that it has. Um, and that, that was really cool being a part of that. Yeah. Um, can you tell us like, so something like Black Panther, like how long did you work on that? Like start to finish? Ooh, I think that that was about um, six or seven months. As compared to a smaller movie, which was like how long? How many months? Um, smaller movies, sometimes you might have a, about a two month window of filming, um, depending on how much prep time you have and, and wrap time. Um, usually you get a week or two of prep and maybe a week or two of wrap. Um, Zombieland was a relatively quick movie and I think we did that over the course of a, about 10 weeks of filming, a couple of weeks of prep and a couple of weeks of wrap. So and you're talking about Zombieland Double Tap, right? The newest yeah, one. The second one. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, as far as uh, I know that you trans, you, you were in the North Carolina market for quite a long time. Yes. And then you transferred over to the Atlanta market. Can, can you talk about that and what goes on when you go from one market to another? Uh, well, film, film by its um, nature is a pretty portable product. You can go anywhere, unless you need the Manhattan skyline, you can film a movie that's supposed to take place in New York if it's a lot of apartments and stuff like that. Um, you can film it anywhere. A good example, very good example is Homeland, which was supposed to, the first three seasons I worked on, that was supposed to be in uh, Washington, D.C. And we filmed that in Charlotte, North Carolina. Downtown Charlotte has a lot of buildings that look very federal. So 
they could pose as DC buildings and you could have machine gun battles and car chases and explosions that they didn't really want to do in Washington, DC. Um, so <laughs> moving from one market to another, um, I had a lot of people that I had known for years that lived in the Atlanta market. So when I made the decision to move from North Carolina to Georgia, uh, I already had contacts in the market down here. I had to do a little bit of transfer with the union, um, but that was a relatively easy process because I had contacts down here. Um, so it wasn't that hard to change markets. The, uh, thing that prompted that was the fact that the incentive program in North Carolina was allowed to expire, to run out. So they didn't have tax incentives anymore in North Carolina. So a lot of productions, Georgia already had a booming film business and a lot of productions pulled out of North Carolina when the incentive package was allowed to expire. Okay. And you were, you were mentioning unions. I mean, do you have to be in a union? to work on um, a movie? Um, you don't have to be, but it does help quite a bit. Um, most of the major studios have agreements with all of the major unions, um, SAG, DGA, the Teamsters, the IA covers a lot of the construction and what I do, um, hair and makeup is a covered craft camera department is IA, so it does help if you're gonna want to work in, if you're working on movies that are produced by any one of the Disney subsidiaries, they all are required by their contracts to try to hire union people. So it, it does help if you wanna work on stuff like that if you want to get more into independent features or um, a lot of reality TV uh, or non-union production. So it, it, it doesn't, you're not re required to be in it to work in the film business. It, it does give you a network and a, um, put you in a network that gets you a lot of contacts. Do you, do you have any advice for students who want to start in the business? Like, what would you suggest somebody do after that? I mean, can they can they start working it when they are like on you know summer break, or do they need to wait till they graduate? Any any way that you can get in to the business, um, any avenue. If you have um, professors that know people who are in the industry and can get you contacts, and you can go out and if there's a shoot going on on a weekend or over summer break, or if you can, um, in what I do, uh, there's a lot of equipment. So a really good way to meet people is to get a job at an equipment rental house. Um, that way you meet the gaffers and the best boys and their crews as they come in to get the equipment. Uh, that That's a great way to make a lot of contacts. And then and we do it all the time. We get people that'll come out when we have big work on the weekends. If we have to go into a big location and wrap out of it on a Saturday after they filmed that at all night, Friday night, we may bring some of the guys out from the rental house to help us pick all the gear up. Um, they know what it is. They're going to take care of it because it's the rental house that they work at. Uh, and that, that's a good way to make contacts and get into the business as well. Um, so there, there's not really a single good pathway, you know, like yeah. this is how you do it, but it's, it's a lot about networking and contacts and um, meeting people, talking to people and just being willing to jump and, and, and go out. You, you know, you might, you might go out and work on a Saturday and then not work for that person for another couple of months, couple of years or, who knows, you know, you might go out and work and they're like, they're a really good hard worker, good attitude, showed up on time. Job yeah. opens up in a couple of weeks and you get hired more. Yeah, speaking of that, like if somebody, like if a student was like, okay, I, I don't know if I really can do this. I don't really know anything about it. Um, if they just, if somebody just like 
shows up for the job and is willing to learn and is a hard worker, is that good enough for, you know, for your crew or for somebody, you know, somebody else's crew? Hardworking, willing to learn, willing to ask questions and, and jump in and do it is about 90% of the job. Not, not doing brain surgery, not building rockets to go to Mars. It's uh, in, in what I do, it's a lot of physical labor. Um, sometimes you may have to work in the rain. We, we had to wrap out of a location on Dr. Sleep where every single one of us from the rigging gaffer down to the guys that were just coming in for that one day were covered head to toe in mud. We wrapped out in the rain for the entire day. We were all soaking wet, muddy. It was absolutely miserable, but the boss to the bottom man, everybody was out there doing it. Yeah. Where, where would somebody search for, for openings? Like, is there, um, is there like a website? Um, I mean, I know in Atlanta, the Georgia Film Commission has stuff. Um, is there any place else that you would suggest people could find jobs like um, this, like day jobs, anything? Sometimes you'll see them advertised. There, there are different websites that um, crew up. I don't really know. Staff Me Up, I think. There's one called Staff Me Up, yeah. Um, but that's a good place to look. Um, again, just networking, talking to people. Um, I, I know a lot of people that have come out of an area in Little Five Points that were bartenders at bars in Little Five Points that crew guys would go to all the time. And then they wound up getting into the film business, either working in restaurants and, you know, just meeting people that way, which is a crazy way to get in. But um, the film business is uh, carnies with better dental insurance, basically. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, there are a lot of pathways to get in. Uh, it, it's basically networking and answering your phone. And a lot of times when you're trying to get in, you may be called in to replace somebody that has called out sick that day. So it's kind of like you might get a call at the last minute, you know, 10 o'clock the night before, Hey, can you come at six in the morning to help us out here? And being able to do that, that's, that's a good way to pick up work and make connections. And yeah. So, I mean, from I, I, another question is from like a technical standpoint, are there, does your job change um, when there are like technical advances? Yes, um, a case in point over the last several years with the advent of a lot of the LED lighting fixtures that we use now, um, they, are, they are like a laptop computer that produces different lighting effects now. So you have, um, a lot more reliance on dimmer board operators and the um, dimmer systems that can control all those lights. They give you an incredible amount of flexibility, but they also are not just, oh, let's run a bunch of power out here to set. Now you have to run a bunch of power and have a data network that can tell all of those lights what they need to do. Um, so that has changed the business over the course of the last few years quite a bit because it's it's pretty ubiquitous to have some sort of at least wireless network that controls the lights on set even if it's a smaller tv show or a smaller film you'll have somebody out there with an ipad a lot of the lights you can control with apps on your phone now but you have to have at least a little network that allows you to connect the phone to a Bluetooth transmitter that talks to the lights. And so there's a little bit of it, even at a very rudimentary level, when you start getting up into bigger things like the Marvel movies, you'll have multiple universes, which is a way of talking about the amount of data that you need. Um, you'll have multiple universes on a single set and you wind up with a, a lot of not only power and hanging the lights, but then controlling how the dimmer board talks to all of those lights. 
So you'll have an entire department that that's all they do is, is the control data that you'll hang lights, you'll run power to them, you'll get the data to them so that it can all talk and work. So it, it definitely, um, as the technology advances and things get more controllable and more technical, it allows you, it allows the gaffer to do a lot of things that were real specialty. Um, case in point, the Airy Sky Panel has a lot of built-in effects that are just available at the touch on the back of the screen. You can make it look like an ambulance. You can make it flash like police lights. You can do fireworks or welding effects that are built into the light. You can also put gels in a lot of the LED lights that used to you would cut a piece of gel, cut a piece of plastic and put it on the light. Now you can just dial it in right there on the light or through the dimmer board. Um, so, so it, Gives so you a lot of versatility. Advances, the technical advances have made things um, a lot easier and a lot more flexible or or kind of the same. It's interesting. It's it's shifted. Um, instead of having a cart that is loaded with gels, you you can get rid of the cart that's loaded with gels now by carrying these LED lights that can do all of those effects. But now you have to have a guy on the crew that can control a computer that can make the lights do all of that. So you're not paying money to buy all the gels anymore, but now you're paying money to rent the guy's gear that can make his computer talk to the lights to do it all. So it's, it's juggled around a little bit. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I want to, um, MBS and a, MBSA really wants to thank you so much for doing this career um, focus with us. Um, it's been really fascinating to learn all about what a reading gaffer does. And um, we thank you very much for talking with us, for answering our questions. And um, we hope that we'll be able to talk to you maybe sometime again. So everybody, this if you want to um, know what uh, Tom has done, you can go to uh, Thomas H. Dean on um, imdb.com and you can take a look at what, what he's done over the last 30 years in his career. Um, and see maybe if that's a career that you want to do someday soon, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. You have a nice day. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.